I'm going to say. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the National Association of Scholars' latest webinar in its Great American Literature webinar series. Um, I'm David Randall, Director of Research at the National Association of Scholars, your moderator, and I'm delighted to present um, the discussion on Dashiell Hammett's The Maltese Falcon. Now, our three distinguished panelists are Dr. Tom Devine, 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 Divine. Divine. Thank you. Um, a professor of history at California State University, Northridge, where he teaches on 20th century American history and culture and is the author of Henry Wallace's 1948 presidential campaign and the future of post-war liberalism. Uh, our next panelist is Dr. Martin Edwards, crime fiction writer, critic and historian, current president of the Detection Club, and author of the Harry Devlin novels, the Lake District Mysteries, uh, the Rachel Safranake novels, and several nonfiction works such as The Golden Age of Murder. Our third panelist, Dr. Cynthia Hamilton, is Professor Emerita in American Literature and Cultural History at Liverpool Hope University. Uh, her publications include Sarah Paretsky, Detective Fiction as Trauma Literature. Now, I have not mentioned all of the publications of our distinguished panelists. These should appear shortly in the chat button below with Amazon links. Everyone is to go to Amazon and buy all of their works at once. Um, I say this and then I go to chat and QA buttons. The structure of how we do things and how you comment. There are going to be 12 to 14 minute presentations in happily conversational tone by our three panelists in order by last name alphabetically. We then go to the Q&A button. button. Q&A section of the discussion where you, the panelists, uh, you, the audience, uh, not my day, uh, will provide questions in the chat or the Q&A buttons below. I will pass them on to the panelists, or they can read them themselves, um, talk to one another. Uh, everything will be done informally. I say this to assure you, among other things, if your question is not chosen, then you may send me email after the... Um, webinar to randall at nas.org, r-a-n-d-a-l-l at nas.org. I will be delighted to forward your questions to the panelists so they may have the option to respond to you. Any question you have ought to be answered, even if it isn't answered during these 90 minutes. Also, if you have to leave, or if you want to just tell people about this later, which you should, uh, this will be on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel within 24 hours in perpetuity. So everybody will get a chance to see this again, even if they have to tune out partway through. Um, I am mentioning, to, because there's a question, yet, yes, no audience attendees are not shown. It's only cameras and microphones are only established for the panelists. Now, having said that, I am delighted to ask first, uh, Professor Devine, would you please be the first to speak? Sure, thank you. And thank you for uh, including me and inviting me. I'm, uh, I'm the dilettante here. My, my specialty is not uh, literature or uh, it, I'm not a, a detective or a crime fiction writer. Uh, my experience with the Maltese Falcon is really as a teacher and teaching it uh, from a historical perspective. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that today, although I'm happy to answer questions later regarding, you know, how does the book fit into the, the historical period that was written in you know, 1928-29. It's been called a novel of the depression. But uh, really what I'm interested in uh, today is the, the question that is at the center of a lot of these, these YouTube presentations is why is, what makes the uh, Maltese Falcon a great American novel? Um, and I think the, the question to that is I, I read a critic who said, this isn't a detective novel. It's a novel about a detective. And that allows us to, to broaden our, uh, our, our viewpoint a little bit and think in terms of what kind of a person is Sam Spade. And I think a lot of the criticism, literary criticism of this novel has, has reflected on those uh, ideas, his, the nature of his character, the nature of his moral philosophy, uh, the, the way he approaches the world and uh, 
how characters that surround him compare and contrast to the to his own philosophy. And so with that in mind, I, I thought I'd just touch briefly on why do I teach this novel to my students? Which is another way of, of uh, asking, you know, why is this a great American novel? I think as a teacher, we always have to ask ourselves before we assign any assignment or any reading, why do I want my students to read this? And if we can't answer that question, then we should probably think about deciding something else. Um, and so as a teacher thinking about why do I want my students over say the last 20 years or more to read the Maltese Falcon, I think we get at some of the answers for why is it a great American novel? And at, at the most general level, you can say the themes it engages are, are timeless, not just limited to a, a context of the 1920s, early 1930s. Uh, there's uh, various things you, you see in this novel. There's a engages the consistency or fluidity of, of character or a code of ethics. It's, it reflects on the nature of truth and, and corruption. And it also talks about empathy. I'll, I'll speak a little bit about that in a second. Um, it looks at how valuable are universal values. Um, it looks at the artificiality of sentimentality. The other thing I found that makes it an enduring novel is as I said, over a course of 20 years, I've taught it different ways. And I think that's what makes literature so, so interesting and useful to us as, as a way of getting people to think is that as our historical context changes, the way I teach this novel changes a little bit. I haven't taught it in a few years, but I was as I reread it and I went over my notes about the way I used to teach it, I think it's such an ideal novel for me to revive now in my classroom because it talks about truth. And we live, especially here in the United States, in a period of time, um, you know, not to be overly presentist, where we're beginning to worry or wonder about our moorings to truth and the way that truth in this novel becomes so relative and how Sam Spade, the protagonist, gives a uh, almost a running commentary on the unreliability of truth just struck me uh, as, as a, someone living in 2022 and thinking about how, how uh, you know, flexible and fluid truth has become in not only in our political discussions, but in the way we get information and how, how can we trust the information we get. Uh, in, as college professors, we're, we're now being told, you know, you really need to emphasize to your students how to trust their sources, how to be critically thinking about what is the truth. And I think students with that in mind, and all of us with that in mind, again, this, this novel speaks to some of those issues in ways that I hadn't thought about prior to the last few years, uh, that there's, there's uh, a new freshness that comes to me when I read this again. But if those are the, the broader ideas, I think I want to I look at just three in the time I have, uh, three main themes. That is the first Sam Spade as a detective, uh, the second theme is the idea of, of truth and, and uh, deception. And the third is authority and corruption. And I'll, I'll, I'll hit these one at a time. I think the first and most obvious way we often teach the Maltese Falcon is looking first at Sam as a, as a protagonist and comparing and contrasting him to other literary detectives over the over the years. Uh, start, you could start with Edgar Allan Poe, but I think the, the, the comparison I see most often is, is to Sherlock Holmes and how uh, Sam Spade represents a new kind of, of detective. And that I think does uh, speak to historical context, but I think there are also some other large themes in here. So when I think about Sam Spade and I talk to my students about what kind of a detective is he, um, I'll ask him, well, what, why isn't he not like Sherlock Holmes? I mean, he doesn't walk around with a magnifying glass and a pipe or anything like that. He's not involved in putting together intellectual puzzles. He's not like a CSI detective, you know, to give a modern example, doing DNA samples or things like that. Uh, I always point out to them, he doesn't even, when he's asked, do you want to look at Miles Archer's body? He says, oh, no, that's not necessary. Um, you know, and, and we sort of, it, from a CSI perspective, we say, well, wait a minute, wouldn't that be necessary? But what Sam is uh, that I think our other notions of a detective is, is he's coming at it from a different, uh, a different place. 
Sam Spade as a, as a literary character, unlike Holmes, is part of the plot. Uh, the plot actually can change based on Sam's activities, uh, whereas Holmes is almost like from an Olympian obser observation point, looking and and at the action that often has already happened. The murder is done, and Sherlock Holmes is called in to, to look at it and to solve the problem. Uh, Sam uh, is like almost like a ping pong ball or a pinball in a, in a machine where his actions affect the plot and other people's actions affect him and his own stake in it uh, is very high stakes. He uh, is you know, threatened with death at certain points during the, the novel. Um, I, I always found it interesting that Hammett especially puts in it. it uh, repeats during the course of the novel where Gutman will say to Spade, you're a character, sir, you're a character. And I always think, yeah, he is a character. He, he's part of what's going on in the novel. I think uh, beyond that, because he is part of what's going on in the novel, it, it makes us look at him in different ways. So the next question I ask my students is, is he a good detective? I mean, he doesn't have his magnifying glass. He doesn't care about the DNA. Is he, is he any good? And I think to me over the years, what students have said and what I agree with is that, yeah, he's good because he is able to see the world through multiple perspectives. And he doesn't delude himself uh, as the other characters do in this novel. He reads people well, he is a skilled listener. Um, he teases out the truth by continuing to question them and then comparing it to what uh, he's heard from other characters cross-checking everything based on what everyone else has had to say. And that makes him effective because unlike the other characters, it's not that truth is completely relative, but he understands that when people come to delude themselves and, and conflate truth with their own biases and their own prejudices or their own preconceptions, they are themselves not only being deceptive, but deceiving themselves. And I think so much of our modern day encounters with truth bear that out, that we have the confirmation bias, which we conflate with truth. What makes Sam so good is he is looking uh, for the truth. Ironically, in some cases, he has to lie to get closer to the truth. but. Unlike the other characters uh, in this plot that he is a part of, he recognizes that he does not have all of the answers. Uh, he's not putting together an intellectual puzzle because he doesn't even have all the pieces yet. But by looking at what people are saying and the way they see the truth, he can come closer to what he thinks is a, a solution or a, you know, a conclusion to the, the questions he has to ask himself uh, as a detective. By being sensitive to other people's point of view, he knows what to say to win their trust, uh, to uh, you know extract information from them, and he anticipates well. He reacts quickly to changing situations because of those personal skills. Then, to me, that is what makes him an interesting uh, detective. The other thing that that I find fascinating with Sam Spade as a detective is that we never know quite how truthful he is. Uh, if you in the plot, for those of you, I'm sure you, you as you've read the novel, even we as the readers remain suspicious of Sam. Just how honest is this guy? Uh, that that and that's part of the the plot. I think that that makes this a compelling novel. Is we're engaged like in in so much of detection detective fiction. Its its strength is to deeply engage the reader and and build suspense. I think we're less in suspense about maybe even the plot, but more about Sam. How honest is he? Are we getting what he's getting or, or is he deceiving us as he tries to come closer to the truth, uh, often in the process, deceiving others? So I think th that's the first little bit there on, on uh, the detective, Sam as detective and his relationship to the truth, which segues to the second thing I was going to, to mention is truth and deception are such 
prevalent characteristics of this no, themes of this novel. Um, the characters, in a way, they're all searching for the truth. Where is the falcon? How do I get the falcon? Um, but each one is also kind of chasing a dream, and that their own truth is self-delusion, as we as we find out by the end, that the falcon itself is is not what anybody thought it was. And they convince themselves what they want to believe. And then that becomes their truth. On the other hand, Sam sees that we should be very skeptical of anyone who is preaching universal truths. And for those of you who have a, of a knowledge of Hammett's background, this struck me as interesting because Hammett was very attracted to the, to, the com, to the Communist Party. And if you're looking for any movement that has universal truths and rigid acceptance of truth, it's it's to follow the party line. But yet Hammett as an author seems very skeptical of any of these universal values or systems that are always predictable and cannot be changed. Things are always, beams are always falling. Things are falling elsewhere. Um, we shouldn't assume someone is being honest simply because they tell a good story. That's another point, I think. Throughout the novel, he said, well, that's a good story, but it's not the truth, but I like the story. I think today we often conflate someone telling a good story with the truth, uh, but because we like the story, we, we accept it as truth. The strength of Sam and the distinctiveness of Sam is he doesn't. He knows the difference between a good story and, and someone who's telling the truth. Um, he's very adaptable. He's willing to change as the situation changes. That doesn't necessarily mean he has no sense of ethics or no sense of, of honor. We see in the, the novel that really he, his idea of his code of ethics is unique to his own, but it, there's something to it. He believes Miles Archer is his partner. And if a guy is your partner, you, you stick up for him. Even as Hammett injects, he doesn't even like Miles Archer. He's sleeping with his wife. Uh, but the point of him being his partner is what motivates him. In many ways, this novel isn't necessarily just about where's the falcon. It's the central question might even be who killed Miles Archer. And once that question is answered, then everything fits together. I'm looking at the time, so I want to keep going and go on to uh, the third uh, aspect that I, I, dispect, I, I deal with with students is authority and corruption. Am I near the end, uh, David? Um, give it a, a, another two to three minutes. Okay, I'll go. I'll go. I'll go quickly. I just make the, the the most important point. I guess of, I think of all of this is Hammett suggests, as I said, we sh we should adhere to a certain individual code of ethics. Um, that we respect authority, but we need not respect authority figures. That's a key distinction. Uh, the corruption we see in this novel is often being uh, carried out by people who consider themselves authority figures, whether it be the police, whether it be wealthy people, whether it be uh, you know the, the adversary Sam has to con confront. Um, he is yet at the same time, though skeptical of all people in authority, he sees reason to have rules. He sees a reason to have a, a, an important system that he would follow. And just to, to conclude then, what the, briefly on the, the story of the Flipcraft story, which every literary critic can't resist diving into, and everyone has a different view. I think the important thing about the, the Flipcraft story is not necessarily that beams fall, but that you get used to them falling. Uh, and it, it's, as Hammett puts it, the thing that Spade most liked about the story was how the reaction of the man after his entire life flashes be before his eyes is to cut off that life, but then he starts a new life and it's just like the old life. People usually don't react that way to these things, uh, but this man did. And it makes you wonder if, if Hammett himself is thinking about that, uh, whether, whether the consistency of Sam Spade is what Hammett most admires, that uh, he is going to fall in love with Bridget maybe, but he's not going to give up his code. He's going to flip back to the way he was despite everything being uh, thrown out of out of proportion, out of out of control by this whole plot that he's been through. So I'll, I'll, I'll cut right there and um, thank you again for, for having me on and uh, discussing a novel I really enjoy reading and teaching. Thank you so much. Um, we're now going to go to Dr. Edwards. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much. That 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 was uh, that was wonderful, Tom, and very enlightening indeed. 
And I should start um, really in the way that most or many uh, detective novels end. I should start with a confession because I'm not Dr. Edwards. I am not uh, uh, an academic at all. I'm, I'm a plain Martin Edwards and I am uh, 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 a novelist, a detective, crime novelist, uh, sometimes a critic, sometimes a historian of the genre. But, um, but most of all, um, I'm a fan of detective fiction. And I have been since I was a very small boy. And I discovered Agatha Christie at the age of eight. And I conceived two uh, ambitions. First of all, to read as much crime fiction as I could lay my hands on. And secondly, to write detective stories myself. And it took a very long time, but, but eventually I managed to do that. And I've never stopped since uh, the first novel was published many, many years ago. Now, uh, because I love detective stories, one of the um, uh, great critical articles about the genre that has always rankled with me is, uh, is entitled Why Do People Read Detective Stories? by Edmund Wilson, uh, a critic eminent in, in uh, the States, uh, much less well known, I think, in, in, in Britain, where I'm, I'm speaking to you from, but uh, still, still known amongst uh, crime fans, if not necessarily uh, adored, because Edmund Wilson really didn't like uh, uh, detective stories. He hated Agatha Christie and Dorothy L. Sayers, and he uh, didn't really answer his own question in that essay because he, he clearly didn't like uh, detective stories. He, he had a few kind words for uh, Arthur Conan Doyle uh, and Poe and uh, Rex Stout, but um, he did in that essay refer specifically to the uh, uh, Maltese Falcon. Uh, and, and in referring to this book, he says, Hammett lacked the ability to bring the story to imaginative life. And he compares him unfavorably to Rex Stout, the creator of Nero Wolf, who was a good writer, but, but I would argue not in the uh, same league as uh, Hammett. And he doesn't stop there, he, he goes on and for good measure, he argues that the Maltese Falcon seems not much above those newspaper picture strips in which you follow from day to day, the ups and downs of a strong-jawed hero and a hard-boiled but beautiful adventurous. Well, here we are, um, you know, more than 90 years after the Maltese Falcon uh, was uh, first published. Um, the National Association of Scholars has invited us all to discuss it, and you, you're here to uh, take part and ask questions. So, so I, 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 think, um, I think Wilson was profoundly wrong. And, uh, and I think that there is much more to this book than, than he recognized. And there are many different ways of, of looking at the Maltese Falcon, Tom's, Tom's articulated a number of them all, already today. I, I come at this book from the perspective of a fan, as I say, and as a fellow crime writer, much less distinguished, of course. And I, I've, argued uh, most recently in, in a history of uh, the crime genre, life of crime, that there are two uh, questions which recur endlessly throughout the history of the genre. The first is a question of identity. Who am I or who are you? So questions about identity, impersonation, fake lives, uh, issues of personality and character. Who is this person? Or who is the unreliable narrator in reality? So that's one question. And the second question, again, recurrent throughout the genre in all its different forms, is who can I trust? And that's a question asked by detectives, it's asked by uh, people in psychological suspense novels, whether it's Gone Girl or uh, many years ago, the um, Victorian novels of sensation by Wilkie Collins, an author who's a great influence on uh, Gillian Flynn, as well as many others. And I think that these questions of identity and trust are central also to the Maltese Falcon. And I think that 
this is also a novel that reflects um, one of the key elements of the answer to Edmund Wilson's question, why do people uh, read detectives what stories, why do they enjoy them? Now, four years after Wilson wrote his famous essay, the uh, English poet W.H. Auden wrote uh, another very famous essay called The Guilty Vicarage. Now, Auden was much more my sort of uh, uh, character because he loved detective stories, but he particularly loved the classical English detective story. And in this essay, The Guilty Vicarage, he presents his interpretation of the detective story in, in terms of a, a Christian allegory. And the way that Auden sees it is, is this, that the crime has a, occurred, it disrupts order, it, it's something terrible that's happened in the, in the great good place. And the role of the detective is to restore order. And at the end of the story, order is, resol is resolved, restored. We go back to normal. Society can breathe again. And that was Auden's view. And it's a very uh, well-argued uh, article. It's, uh, it, it's very persuasive in some ways. But uh, for me, although it's often quoted to this day, as, uh, as one of the most uh, credible interpretations of the appeal of detective fiction, its restoration of order. I, I don't personally think that it goes far enough. And to me, the, the larger question is that of the addressing of uncertainty and the potential resolution of uncertainty through the fictional uh, form of a detective or crime novel, a novel of suspense. If we take one, one of the other great uh, American crime writers, Patricia Highsmith, she certainly is, is not a writer who restores order in, in books like Strangers on a Train, Talented Mr. Ripley and all the rest of them. But her novels are very much about unsettling experiences, uncertainty. And for me, uh, the detective novel, the crime novel, the novel of suspense, however we, uh, we term it, whatever subgenre we're talking about, we're looking at uncertainty and the way in which the characters cope with uncertainty. And I think that particularly in the present era, just as in the so-called golden age of uh, detective fiction between the two world wars, we live in very, very uncertain times. And this may explain why crime fiction is uh, having such enormous global success. And, and, and it undoubtedly is, all the, all the sales figures uh, uh, prove that. Now, I think that a reader who came to the Maltese Folk when it first appeared in installments in the Black Mask magazine would have expected something a little bit different. Dashiell Hammett had established himself as a writer of uh, uh, good pulp fiction stories. He had a private eye character called the Continental Op, who appeared in many short stories and also his first two novels. And he worked for an agency, uh, and Hammett would work for Pinkerton's detective agency. But with Sam Spade, we get a development in Hammett's writing and a development in the character of the detective. Sam Spade is, is one of two partners in a detective agency. Uh, his other partner, Miles Archer, is killed uh, uh, very early on in the story, murdered. So, so he's a one-man band. And so the focus is very different. And the focus is much more on the character than it was in the Continental Op stories. He's a lone wolf, as Thomas said, he's having an affair with Archer's wife, although the relationship with her isn't, uh, isn't great. There's a degree of comparison between Hammett, the tough guy, the womanizer, and, and, uh, and Sam Spade, and Samuel was Hammett's first name. But I don't think we can take that too far. And I think it's very interesting when we look at the very first uh, paragraph of the novel, there's a description of uh, 
Spade's face, which uh, ends like this. He looked rather pleasantly like a blonde Satan. So rather pleasantly, blonde Satan. That's unexpected. It's a bit of a knockout punch. It pulls us up short. And already in the very first paragraph of the novel, we have a contradiction, something unsettling that, that isn't quite what we might have uh, come to expect. And in a conventional mystery, the hook is, what's the solution to the puzzle? Uh, what's going to happen? Who killed the victim? Uh, how was it done? What was the motive? Will they get away with it? Um, we do ask these questions in the Maltese Falcon, and, and I do agree with Tom that the murder of Miles Archer is, is central. But it's the uncertainty about the characters and the motivations that, that is fundamental. It's what the uh, British crime novelist and, and critic uh, Julian Simmons described as a lasting ambiguity about Sam Spade. And we we see this again, I think it's very elegant artistically, in the very final lines of the story. The villains are either dead or in the hands of the police. And Effie, Sam's secretary, comes along and tells him that Ivor Archer, the, uh, the widow of his partner, has arrived in the office. And the book ends like this. Spade, looking down at his desk, nodded almost imperceptibly. Yes, he said, and shivered while sent her in. Shivered. That isn't conventional. There's nothing of the orthodox, and there's certainly nothing of the newspaper picture strip about, about that, that word. And famously, Hammett doesn't tell us what his characters are thinking or feeling. We have to base our understanding of them on, uh, on, on what is actually said and done. And this ambiguity means that we need to think about the characters. We need to look for clues. Now, at this time, the late 1920s, detective fiction, whether it was the classic English mystery or the pulp private eye stories, uh, it was very plot based. So the clues related to the plot. Hammett introduces us to the idea of clues to character. And this was a very significant development. And there is, as Tom said, the uncertainty about Sam's honesty. It's true even in the closing scenes when Sam says to Bridget, don't be too sure I'm as crooked as I'm supposed to be. He may simply be a smart businessman. So he is uncertain, and it's not just the question of the honesty. Hammett said in introducing a reprint in 1934, he's a dream man, but he's not a fantasy figure in the way that Lord Peter Whimsey, the uh, great detective introduced by Dorothy L. Sayers in Britain a few years earlier, was certainly in his early years uh, very much a, a fantasy figure. He, he's, he's something rather different, he's something rather more sophisticated and as he says everybody has something to conceal and this is true in fiction it's tr certainly true in detective fiction it's true in real life as well I think and Sam isn't the only person in the book who's difficult to fathom so Bridget O'Shaughnessy is uh, is a shapeshifter she begins as Miss Wanderley she's briefly Miss LeBlanc then she reveals her real name if it is her real name and her behaviour throughout is consistently misleading, it unsettles us. And right at the end, uh, one of the things that he says to her is, is all we've got is the fact that maybe you love me and maybe I love you. And when she whispers that he knows whether he loves her or not, he says, I don't. So the uncertainty extends to the relationships between the key characters in the novel. Does he love her or does he not? Bridget's face is bleak, but it's one of those cases where Hammett is prepared to leave us without a definitive answer. It's for the reader to decide to pick up clues. Now, much has been said about his use of terse dialogue and physical description. In my um, 
uh, edition of the book, The Failure of Society, which is on the shelf behind me, uh, there are 12 different colours mentioned on the first page of the story. And this sharpness and clarity of description, albeit brief, is quite striking, but it's also in contrast to the blurred nature of the characters' uh, uh, behaviours. And I think that uh, touching briefly, and I know Cynthia's going to talk, talk further about this, uh, touching briefly on Flitcraft, the Flitcraft parable, um, I, I agree with, with Tom's view. The, the key conclusion that, that we take from it is that Flitcraft adjusted to beams falling and disrupting life, and then he adjusted to beams not falling. And this is, I think, the point that Hammett is making here. It's that Flitcraft adapts to change. The randomness of life is a given, but Flitcraft is one of those people who's able to adapt to it. And we know from the research by happiness consultants, not very interesting, uh, field of work that, that uh, uh, studies have shown that people who've experienced major life traumas or major life uh, uh, benefits like winning a lottery, you know, after a period of uh, elation or despair, very often their, their, their uh, feelings and attitudes revert more to the norm. Uh, and I think that this is, this is a, a bit like flipcraft. So I think that this is the issue that, that uh, uh, is underlying uh, not just the appeal of uh, the Maltese Falcon, but also the appeal of crime fiction in all its many different guises. Uh, uh, we're uncertain about Sam, we can pick up the clues, we can arrive at our own conclusions about him and his relationships, as, as well as the, the storyline. Does the falcon ever exist? Does it really exist or is it just a myth? Uh, something that will never be found. Hammett raises that question amongst many others. And I think it's in this uh, uh, fictional version of uncertainty that Hammett presents us with a classic example of the detective story at its finest, whatever Edmund Wilson thought. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go to our third panelist, Dr. Hamilton. Thank you. And thank you, Tom and Martin. Uh, very useful comments that I'm going to build on, particularly in relation to uncertainty. And I'm going to look at the Flitcraft parable fairly specifically, uh, but come at it from a slightly different angle because I think the core of the Flitcraft parable explores the power and the limitation of storytelling. And I think that that is a key thematic thread in the novel. Before I look at the importance of storytelling in the Maltese Falcon itself, I think it's worth noting the role of storytelling in detective fiction as a genre. And you can argue that detective fiction is about the battle between individuals to create a definitive narrative. That is, characters compete to construct a story that will explain the evidence in a way that exonerates them. So in a sense, detective fiction is focused on whose narrative will be affirmed as definitive. And of course, it does really matter whose narrative wins. Everyone in detective fiction has a story to tell. The criminal wants to explain evidence in a way that hides guilt. The suspects are concerned with telling stories that divert suspicion from them and point the finger of blame somewhere else. Witnesses provide evidence and sometimes work to construct at least partial narratives. And then we have the detective, of course. The detective works to incorporate the facts into a solution, into a definitive account that identifies the guilty and exonerates the innocent, a la W.H. Auden and his uh, comments on uh, detective fiction. So in detective fiction, 
it is assumed as part of the foundation of the genre that the solution to the crime put forward by the detective will be presented as definitive and that his story, the one that he comes up with, will be seen as the true story. What's interesting about the Maltese Falcon then is that it suggests otherwise, other possibilities. Hammett uses the Flipcraft parable to suggest that a definitive narrative may not be possible, that the whole premise on which detective fiction is based is debatable and possibly even naive. The idea that it is possible to use real world evidence to ascertain with any certainty the significance of the evidence, in other words, in any way to get at the truth. So the implication of the Flipcraft parable is that what people construct may not be the truth, that may, it may be instead only a believable fiction. So the story that uh, the Flipcraft parable is told by Spade to Bridget, and it's about the man who lives an ordered life and going to, to lunch, he is almost hit by a falling beam, which lands on the pavement and throws up a chip which scars his cheek, and he carries the scar ever after. But that's the only physical damage. The real damage that the beam does is to his sense of what reality is of an ordered world. And this is what Spade says about the impact, the importance of this Flitcraft parable. And I'm going to quote now. It was not primarily the injustice of it that disturbed him. What disturbed him was the discovery that insensibly ordering his affairs, he had got out of step and not into step with life. He said he knew before he had gone 20 feet from the fallen beam that he would never know peace again until he had adjusted himself to this new glimpse of life. I don't think he even knew he had settled back naturally into the same groove he had jumped out of in Tacoma. But that's the part I always liked. He adjusted himself to beams falling and then no more beams fell and he adjusted himself to them, not falling. So what then is the significance of this in the novel? Well, of course, Spade tells the story to Bridget and he tells it as a kind of warning that not only may her accounts of events not be believed, but that Spade himself does not care about a truthful narrative, that instead he deals with evidence in a way that recognizes the power and limitations of believable fictions. So Flitcraft's story speaks to the core themes that we've been talking about of uncertainty and the difference between seeing and knowing, between appearance and reality, as both Tom and Martin have mentioned. Flitcraft is an expression also of Hammett's skepticism. It recognizes that people assume that life has a meaning and an order that can be understood through their own personal experience. It reflects people's attempts to construct meaning based on their individual experience. It summarizes Hammett's insight into people's need for a definitive narrative for meaning it suggests the power a defining narrative has for the individual, but also for those around them who get caught up in that narrative. And it warns of the dangers posed for those who put too much reliance on a particular version of truth that they're likely to be caught out. So what led to Hammett's interest in the power and limitations of storytelling? Some of it can be explained biographically because as a child and an adolescent, he was moved from pillar to post by his father who was, who was unsuccessful in a whole range of businesses and kept pulling Hammett out of school and taking him elsewhere, falling beams. 
Hamet's illness, his, the Spanish flu, TB, which recurred when things seemed to get more settled for a while and recurred in very severe ways, had an incredible impact on his career and his personal relationships in life, falling beams. There's also, of course, his experience as a detective in terms of alibis and unreliability of people. And finally, I think it's significant that he was an advertising writer for Samuel, Samuel's jewelry and spinning sentimental yarns to sell jewelry, yarns that he knew were false. And he also knew that people wanted very much to believe. So that's Hammett. But Hammett was part of a whole generation that experienced falling beams. There was very notably the impact of World War I, which had a major influence on a whole generation of writers, including Hemingway, often compared with Hammett, Fitzgerald, Faulkner, E.E. E. Cummings, and Wallace Stevens. So I'm looking at Hammett in terms of that generation's skepticism, the skepticism that their experience of World War I engendered about grand narratives, grand narratives, for example, of heroism that manipulated and diminished individual autonomy. And also at his generation's skepticism that any particular perspective can define and explain reality. So we come to what I am going to compare, the writer that I am going to compare Hammett to, not Hemingway as usual, I am going to compare him to Wallace Stevens and to the idea of order at Key West. The poem, Wallace Stevens' poem, focuses on a woman singing on the seashore, and it's about an artist's efforts to construct a believable fiction and the power, but also the fragility of the resulting narrative that is, is put forward. This is Wallace Stevens, I'm going to quote. It was her voice that made the sky acutest at its vanishing. She measured to the hour its solitude. She was the single artificer of the world in which she sang. And when she sang, the sea, whatever self it had, became the self that was her song, for she was the maker. Then we, as we beheld her striding there alone, knew that there never was a world for her except the one she sang and singing made. So what Wallace Stephen is talking about is the construction of a believable fiction and the impact of that fiction on the hearers who listen to her song. And that is what Hammett is talking about in the Maltese Falcon as well. We see Hammett's characters' attempts at believable fictions. Flitcraft's attempts to place himself in sync with the order of the world. Gottman's belief in the veracity of the history of the Maltese Falcon and conviction that in chasing the black bird that he's after, he will obtain the real thing. Spade's discussions with Gutman about how to sell a fall guy to the police. Iva's complete misunderstanding of her relationship to Spade. The police's wild efforts to solve the murders and Bridget's many stories about herself and her efforts to get Spade to buy into a romantic fiction. So what we see in all of these examples is the manipulative power of storytelling. Now, this isn't unusual in detective fiction. Detective fiction generally, in, in, in detective fiction generally, characters attempt to manipulate the detective by telling stories. But the Maltese Falcon comes at this from a slightly different angle. In this novel, the manipulation is not so much aimed at historical accounts of the crime. It's aimed at imposing an order that sex sets expe expectations and roles in a way that predisposes individuals to act in a particular way. So the manipulation acts as a prelude to future action rather than as an effort to define 
the past to create a kind of usable history. And that's quite unusual in the extent to which it happens in the Maltese Falcon. But despite its power to manipulate, storytelling has significant limitation and Spade recognizes that as well. In fact, that is what sets Spade apart from the other characters in the Maltese Falcon. Where unlike the others, Spade is acutely aware of the limitations of believable fictions. You can see this in his insistence on the need for a physical fall guy. You can see it in the way that he debunks Bridget's fictions. And you can see it particularly at the end, as mentioned before, when he tells Bridget that he won't protect her, that he's stepping clear of her romantic and sexual appeal despite the fact that he feels their strength. So what Hammett is doing in, Detective, in, in The Maltese Falcon is writing in a way against the grain of the expectations of detective fiction. What Hammett does is to expose the same relationship between a disordered reality and his characters ordering songs that is explored by Wallace Stevens in the idea of order at Key West. And what is notable about Hammett's critique of his character's attempts to turn believable fictions into definitive accounts is that he does this within a genre that is premised on the identification of one definitive narrative as true. What is also notable about Hammett's achievement is that he exposes the politics of narrative construction with all its manipulative power while hinting at the need to say no to costly narratives that require surrendering too much. And that's the point where it becomes extremely relevant now as well as in Hammett's time. So this exposure of the questionable nature of a central premise of the genre within which he is working is an incredible achievement. And it's, to me, that is what makes one of the many things that makes The Maltese Falcon a great American novel. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So thank you to all. And I'm now going to encourage everyone in the audience, put in your questions, chat, Q&A buttons. And in the meantime, I will start up with, oh, I've got a few questions uh, queued up. I'll start with one. Is it a California novel? Does it have to take place in San Francisco? Does it have to take place in California? Is it to be compared more with Nathaniel West's Day of the Locust, a bit down the coast? Oh, or could it have been set in New Orleans, in New York, in London? Um, your thoughts about whether it's, a, you know, a, a, as much a great West Coast, great California, great San Francisco novel, and necessarily one as just, as compared to just generically an American one, to any and all? Well, um, I, I suppose one, one way to answer that is to point out that Nathaniel West was a friend of Dashiell Hammett. And another way to answer that is to say that one of the questions that you asked about was influence. And I think one of the great rewritings of the Maltese Falcon is actually Chester Hines' The Rage in Harlem, where the surrealism of, um, of Nathaniel West's world comes out very, very strongly. And in a way, the sort of the idea of reality and, and the, the absurdity of, of looking for meaning in, 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 in a world is, um, it is, is part of Nathaniel West's and Chester Himes and is sort of taking Hammett's view one step further, as it were. And because I suppose California has a reputation for being that kind of world. <laughs> it is, it makes it sense uh, useful to set it in California as opposed to New York or Chicago. <laughs> Although of course, Himes is a rage in Harlem is set in New York. 
<laughs> Other people have stand through this. Uh, you're you're muted, I think. I think the just to to agree with everything's been said, and as uh, speaking from someone who's in Los Angeles, um, I think any San Franciscan will tell you it has to be set in San Francisco, and I completely disagree. Um, it has to be set, I think, in a modern city because of the the sense of disorder that comes from the modern city. And so the setting and the city itself, not specifically San Francisco, but the modern, maybe American city is one of the characters and the way that Hammett negotiates that. I've, all, I've read, uh, to make another literary comparison, Tarzan of the Apes, which comes out of left field, I'm sure, not, not detective fiction, maybe not even good fiction, but Tarzan navigates the jungle much like Hammett navigates the city. And these books aren't that far apart in publication date. And so I think there was something going on, especially with male readers who were trying to navigate their own world in a, in a confusing way. And as if Tarzan vicariously, the, the male reader, identifies with Tarzan's ability to navigate a, complica a complicated and unhospitable environment. I think Hammett uses the city that way to, to uh, and, and again, to agree with already what's been said. Um, but I, I, I think the city, a, a city is the important, a disordered city is the important element there. And I will ask the same question of um, Mr. Adrata than Dr. Edwards. Um, <laughs> Uh, because after all, you get the viewpoint from across the puddle, for which the question is, how much did the Maltese Falcon strike you on first or second readings as, you know, specifically Californian as opposed to American? How much did it create your sense of California, your sense of America? I, I think in all honesty, I, I, I would go along with, with Tom and saying it, it it has to be set in a, an American city at that time, but uh, maybe I don't know enough about uh, American cities and the nuances between them to uh, to see the differences as clearly as you will all do. But um, I, I would think that Chandler, Raymond Chandler, was a more characteristically and consistently Californian private eye writer. Than, uh, than Hammett seems to me to be. Um, that's my impression from, uh, from several thousand miles away anyway. Thank you. I'm gonna have a question from the audience, John Wormuth, which I'm gonna push on a bit. Will a view of the film help in understanding the novel? And I'm going to expand on that. What are the strengths of the film in conveying um, Hammett's vision what does it fail to convey? Does it add anything which you can't get from the novel? Um, so in, in effect, there's always the question of translation from one genre to another. It's the strengths and weaknesses of the film and how it helps you to think about the novel to any and all. Well, I can just start as someone who assigns the novel. I tell them that the film is nothing at all like the novel. So that will encourage them to read the novel, not just look at the film. But they are actually quite close. Um, what I just said, I guess, applies here. I think one of the shortcomings of the film may be that it doesn't use the character of the city as well. And that's just in part because of the limitations of shooting at that time, um, that this is more of an indoor film. I mean, you're, you're, these scenes are taking place in rooms, but the film is pretty close and, and uh, 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 it, it matches the dialogue for the most part in the book. So I think this, this film, you lose inevitably in the change of genre a little bit, but because the book itself is, is so spare and, and really is focused on people's behavior and what they say rather than their internal work, the internal workings of their mind, it translates well to film, um, I think. And the film itself is, is, a, is a good film, the 41 version uh, with Humphrey Bogart I'm referencing. Yeah, that, that's that's my view too. It's a long time since I've seen the film, but um, it, it's a fantastic example of the private eye film, I think. And uh, perhaps from memory, less nuanced than the novel, uh, as is often 
the, the way of things, but uh, but still, as as Tom says, a, a very good adaptation. And Professor Hamilton? It's been a very long time since I've seen the film of, of the Maltese Falcon. So um, I am going to defer to Tom and to Martin. But um, I, I, I think that you don't get the deep, the depth of Hammett's worldview in the film. What it comes across more is, is the hard-boiled aspect of, of the character of Hammett and um, the danger of his world, really. Um, and, and, and the relationship between him and Brett, Bridget as a kind of the, the, the starting point of all of the femme fatale films. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, building, you were talking about uh, you know, Edmund Wilson and others you know, dismissing him. So one of the things that happened in the last few generations is that genre fiction has achieved critical respectability. How much is Dashiell Hammett responsible for the rise in critical respectability of well, genre fiction in general, detective fiction in particular? Well, I, I think he is, he is one of, and, and there are a, a significant number, uh, but he's certainly one of those who, who contributed to that. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, that level of critical respectability has increased over the years. Um, I, I say in Life of Crime that the battle hasn't been won, but it's, you know, uh, I think the, the crime writers are winning it uh, and, and will win it. But um, I, I think that Hammett's contribution was significant. He was an early uh, example of the, the uh, author who showed the potential of the genre as, as a novel, not just as a, as a piece of entertainment. And I think that's, uh, that's always a benefit. Uh, and uh, so, so I think that he certainly deserves some credit to, along with a great many others over the years. And others wish to uh, answer this as well? No. Oh, I'll defer because I think this is more uh, the, the, of uh, Cynthia's expertise here. Um, I think Hammett is, because he's such a good writer, um, it certainly has helped the cause of popular, popular fiction. Uh, it, it's, um, there are an awful lot of very good detective novels that can stand on their own. Um, Wilkie Collins, for example, as well, Chester Himes, um, Ishmael Reed working with the formula. I, I think it has helped that um, postmodernism has worked with various forms of genre literature um, and written against the grain of them and made it important to understand the generic um, dynamics that, of the original formulas that they're working with. So I think that's, that's part of what has made them respectable. Um, it's, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> All right, thank you. The only thing I would add on that is, is that I, mean, I don't know if the question was phrased this way. Is this you know what makes a good detective novel? I think this is just a good novel, um, and that that I think is the important thing. That by making a detective novel, judge not as a detective novel, but as a good piece of literature. That's the achievement I think that Hammett is, should be most uh, heralded for. That this isn't just a good detective novel. It's, it's a good novel, and I go back to some of the things that Cynthia was saying that his critique of the genre of detective novels is also, in a way, what makes this an interesting novel on, on its own. All right, so where, what are his great achievements then? And I, I'm just going to put it in 
what is distinctive about his prose style, distinctive even from people with whom he's compared to, such as Hemingway, you know, how does the prose style particularly forward, well, the story, the you know, influence the genre? And I guess, I mean, is it then, is there also, are there innovations in character and plotting in particular that we should be focusing on? I and mean, this is like, getting broad range, but I mean, what is most distinctive and, and most wonderful about him in terms of prose style, characterization, and plotting? Any and all. Well, I, I would say that um, he is an author who um, encourages, almost forces the reader to, to contribute thinking. It's not just all given to you, this, this ambiguity in the character of Sam Spade, for instance, but, but in other aspects of this novel and in other aspects of, of his other novels, particularly The Glass Key, which some people would say is his masterpiece. Not, not sure I, I, I would agree, but, but, but it's, it's certainly very arguable. Uh, so, I, so I think it, it, it's that uh, combination of the terse style and yet, as, as I mentioned, this, this use of colour fascinates me. I'd, I'd forgotten. Uh, when I started to count the number of times he uses colour, um, it, it's, it's very remarkable. And if, if anybody had the time to, to make a comparison between Hammett and, and even somebody like Raymond Chandler, who I think is a terrific writer, but of a very different kind of, Californian private eye writer, because he's, he's got this very lyrical prose with all the, the similes and the metaphors and so on. So it's a different style. So I, I don't think that Hammett created a, a definitive template, but he certainly showed how it could be done and how it could be done brilliantly with that particular style of writing. Others? Other responses? Well, of course, um, Chandler paid um, paid tributes to Hammett's achievements in, in the detective uh, genre and his use of language and style. And um, it says that uh, Hemingway may have learned as much from Hammett as Hammett learned from Hemingway in terms of the, the, the style that is, is used. I think that. Um, in comparison with, with Chandler, uh, Chandler is a much flashier writer in many ways. Um, Hammett's uh, style is, is very, very, very pared down. He, um, he, does, uh, he does use what, what Hemingway called the sequence of motion and fact. Um, but he's very adept at slowing down motion, speeding up motion to, to focus the eye very specifically. I think that happens as well as his use of color and, and, and makes his, his, um, his prose extremely effective. It's, it's also very interesting to see where where you get adjectives and where you just get the sequence of motion and fact, because that, that points to the areas where, where Hammett is, is, is just blanking you as, as a reader and making you make up your own um, mind. It's also his use of spades rolling cigarettes. It, points of high emotion where you expect a reaction is, is absolutely brilliant because you cannot see beyond that. You have to interpret it as you will. You know, just, just a few things that I, I think make uh, Hammett such a brilliant, um, accomplished stylist. I would just add to that list the, the wolfish grin. Uh, that that uh, that Sam Spade gives, and then to to go back to the point of how much it demands of the audience to to try to make that make of that what you will. Uh, one of your your questions to us at the outset of all of this was, um, you know, the novel deals solely with with phys the physical, avoiding references to thoughts, feelings, and motivations. But I think what Hammett's especially good at 
is by their behavior and what they say and the way he describes how they look when they say it, really giving an insight that gives us that gives the reader just enough to get at motivation, to get at their thoughts. And I think that's what brings us so far into the book. Uh, it's so spare, yet at the same time, we do learn so much about these characters so that at the end of the book, we might feel we know them and more about them than we do in some other in another novel like a Dickens or a, a more descriptive novel that, that really goes into character development. You, you feel like you know these characters just as well because of his skill in using their behavior to shed light on motivations and feelings. I, I think that uh, Gutman is a brilliant example of that. Gutman's conversation, his overblown um, praising of, 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 uh, of Spade and uh, just all of the hot air that he spews <laughs> out in, in, in his conversations. And it, it just, the difference between his comments and Spade's comments, just it, it, it's brilliant at developing character in the most efficient um, way possible. Nifty and thank you. I'm gonna have a question about serialization. As you mentioned, it was originally done in serial form. How much does that affect the novel we get? Do we think it would have been any different if he had you know, but, you know, sat down to type an entire novel all at once for you know, a book publisher rather than it having been serialized? Can we tell, are there aspects of it which bear the impress of that still? I, I'm, I, I think it, it's, that's a very interesting question because with many, many writers from any age, I, I think that the impulse would be to build up to a dramatic cliffhanger at the end of each installment. Mm. And it would be very obvious, and it is, is very obvious when, when you see it in uh, all put together in, in the form of a novel. I mean, a British author who uh, may not be so well known in, in the States, but was very successful at one time in Britain, was somebody called Francis Durbridge. And he was essentially a radio and TV writer who was uh, very, very successful with cliffhanger stories. When you read the novels, you, you, you can really tell uh, uh, where each episode ended. And that is not the case with Hammett. And it has a lot to do with, with the points that everyone's been making about the efficiency or economy of style, that, that because it, it's done very consistently, uh, that, that you, you, so to speak, you can't see the joy. So that, that, that's the way that I, I see it. I think that the impact of serialization is much, much more visible in the Dane curse than it is in the Maltese Falcon. Um, I, I, in, 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 in terms of um, the, the politics of uh, cliffhangers. I, I, can only, I remember Street and Smith, uh, a story about one of their um, pulp magazines where uh, a writer had, it was written, it was uh, stories that were written by multiple authors and one author wrote, you know, a, a, a hero into a cabin on a cliff tied up in knots and the next writer had to get him out of there and all I could do was say with one bound he was free. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard the same thing about Batman serials uh, not quite knowing how to get yourself out of it therefore just switching on to the next scene quickly. <laughs> um, I have a question about teaching, I guess, how, what, how many students have read uh, Hammett before, you know, they, you get to them in college, if, I, I guess this is going to be uh, more for the two people who are professors, but uh, you know, how many people have read Hammett before, how much do they need to be explained back to the time, how has teaching it uh, changed in over the you know the last generation or so in terms of students 
general knowledge and background. And I suppose we can talk to, say that about your general audiences as well, so as to bring Mr. Edwards into this also. You know, in fact, you know, as we get farther and farther from San Francisco in 1930, it's going to be a different teaching experience. So how has the teaching of it, the talking about it to the public changed? Do you want to take that one? Go ahead, just. Um, well, I, I've taught the Maltese Falcon in um, in courses on on detective fiction, on the development of detective fiction. So it's I, I, I've taught it in terms of uh, different generic templates and the way they've developed and the way um, different writers have dealt with them and the. Um, the the possibilities and limitations of different generic templates really in terms of uh, students prior prior knowledge I think it's it's very often that they've seen the film not read the novel when they come uh, seen the film on late night uh, television uh, um, rather than read the novel and uh, but students, do tend to enjoy it. And um, they, they want to know who to believe, <laughs> which is um, part of the point of the whole thing. <laughs> but I, I can see teaching it um, in, in a course on the um, cultural history of the interwar years. Um, and I'll, I'll turn that one over to Tom, I think, because he will have more, much more experience of doing that than I. The course I just signed it in is um, called The Popular Arts in United States History. And the chronology of that course goes from 1840 to 1960. And so you are putting Hammett in, a, in the context of a historical arc. And I had referenced Tarzan earlier. Um, in that course, I, they read Mark Twain's novel, Puddin' Ed Wilson, which in the way, in a way is a, is a detective novel of, of its own. Uh, and then Tarzan, uh, they also read an article uh, that's sort of a classic, at least in history, in history by Barbara Welter about uh, true womanhood. And we apply those concepts of, of this article about the nature of Victorian women um, to Bridget O'Shaughnessy. So in a history class, you you it's not even, you know, focus necessarily on genre. It's I can my comparisons I make are to different periods of time and how we see a little bit of, of the, the arc through history. As far as the students prior exposure to Hammett, zero. Um, not even the film, in my experience. And the one exception is uh, I, I taught this class in Venice in English um, to at, at a university at Kofoskari. And those students uh, actually had, they were familiar with the genre and Hammett and, and the movie more so than my American students. Although that may be attributable more to Italian students reading more than my American students. So I, I don't know if that's, that's the case, but uh, the students really do enjoy it. And these days, if I can get a student to read a book and then at the, the end they say they enjoyed it, I've succeeded no matter how they interpret it. Because I think it's really become difficult, I think especially since the, the introduction of iPhone, the iPhones, to get students to, to focus enough time to actually absorb into the core processor of their brain. Their attention spans are so so often so brief that this is, seems to me a perfect novel for today's students. It's short, it's spare, it's quote, not boring as, as they might characterize it. So I think it's a useful, it's still a useful novel, uh, both in a literature class, but also in a history class. Thank you. And Mr. Edwards, I, for the general public. Yes, well, I, I think that certainly in Britain, uh, amongst crime plans, uh, I think it's fair to say that Hammett is um, is is highly regarded and and still quite quite widely read. I, I mentioned the Folio Society edition, which um, which I have that was published, uh, I think, very successfully a few years ago. So so I think that there is continuing enthusiasm, but but of course I I I'm talking about the world of 
established crime fans rather, rather than students uh, uh, as such. When, when I'm talking to students, it's, it's very often people who've signed up for a, uh, uh, some sort of course on golden age detective fiction or something like that. Hmm. Thank you. Um... I, I, I'm going to just go to like a personal question. When did each of you first read the book? And you, know, you, know, what was the context and what was your reaction to it? And I mean, if it, you know, this matters. You know, when does one first get to it? You know, high school, college. You know, as a you know, as a professor, teacher, adult. You know. So, so can, can each of you talk about your know, your discovery of it? Well, in in my case, it was in my this this book. Uh, was in my 20s. I, I bought a, an omnibus of um, the four great novels. And in other words, not the, uh, not the thin man. That, that was the one that wasn't in there. Uh, but it was a big, big omnibus uh, that was uh, uh, published by Picador, a pretty upmarket literary imprint in Britain at that time and still today. And uh, I was... I don't think I was still a student. I think I was in my early twenties, and, and that was when I I read the books. Um, I, I I came to this book um, in graduate school. I was a teaching assistant for a course on uh, similar to the one I late, later based my own course on in U.S. history and the popular arts. Uh, the professor was at the University of North Carolina. His name is John Casson, tremendous cultural historian, and. I don't think I would have come to this book if I hadn't been that teaching assistant, and I'm very glad I was in that class. Uh, so that was what led me to it, not anything, not a particular draw to crime fiction. But once I had read it and I saw the teaching implication, there's so many different themes you could use in a class. I tried, I've now tried to incorporate I, this novel, not a, even in just in US popular culture, but even my US survey class on occasion, uh, to, to because it's such to me a compelling book and a book that students wouldn't read otherwise. Uh, so I think that's how I came to it. And that's how I try to have my students come to it. Thank you. I came to it um, as Tom did as a, a teaching assistant at postgraduate level um, at, at actually at Trinity College in Connecticut. Um, and um, I, it was a course on popular culture of the 1930s. And um, the, the, the problem, the intellectual problem of popular culture just hooked me. And Hammett's style, um, I, I, I was just blown away by his artistic achievement. Um, and um, I've, been, I've been blown away by it ever since. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Um... I am going, I think, to say that we're getting near to the end of our webinar time. So what I will do is ask each of you for a last um, you know, minute or two concluding statement. And then I would do sort of a you know, closing up for everything myself. But um, oh, in reverse order this time, uh, uh, Professor Hamilton, may I ask you to speak first? Um. I, I, I guess that the, the issue of how influential is the Maltese Falcon, how much should we, how much attention should we pay to it? We've answered that question, I think, in terms of the artistic achievement and in terms of the, the place it's had in the development of detective fiction. I think what we haven't said is how much Hammett influenced those who came after him. And um, he was an incalculable influence on generations of hard-boiled detective writers um, from, from um, Raymond Chandler to Ross MacDonald, John D. MacDonald, Chester Himes, Sarah Paretsky, you name it. They, they, they have all been influenced by Hammett. Um, they've all tried in one way or another to rewrite the Maltese Falcon or aspects of it or build on what he, he achieved. I think the, 
The greatest mystery of the Maltese Falcon is why Hammett stopped writing after The Thin Man. And that's, that's the question I can't answer at all. Thank you. Um, Mr. Edwards. Yes, well, it, it's a very good question. I, I, I suppose the answer lies, lies more in his personal life than, than, than his writing life, but uh, who knows? Um, I'm, I'm a great believer in the connections between different types of crime fiction. I, I think that just because I like Dashiell Hammett, and I do very much, it doesn't mean I can't like Agatha Christie or, uh, or, or other types of uh, crime writers. And so I, I, I'd like in closing to pick up on, on one point that Cynthia made that uh, resonated with me. And, and she made the point, you, you recall, that, that Hammett is is showing in the Maltese Falcon that um, there isn't just necessarily one truth. The great detective, a la Sherlock Holmes, is, isn't always going to be right, isn't going to be infallible, but life's more complicated than that. I think it's very interesting that at exactly the same time elsewhere in Britain, the same uh, uh, idea uh, was being promoted by very different writers, but, but equally gifted writers. There was a book in 1913, Trent's Last Case, which um, uh, uh, saw E.C. Bentley showing the great detective getting it wrong. And that, that book became famous because of its great twist, double twist at the end. But really it was an attempt to show that the omniscient detective was a bit of a, a mirage. And in the very same year that uh, uh, Hammett started publishing the Maltese Falcon in the Black Mass, the very same year, 1929. In Britain, Anthony Barclay, a writer I greatly admire, and a writer whom uh, Hammett reviewed uh, when he was reviewing crime fiction, as he did for a period of time, and reviewed him quite favourably by, by Hammett's standards. He wrote a book called The Poison Chocolate Case, which was all about defunc de debunking the infallible detective idea. So there are six different solutions to the mystery. And this, I think, is another way of addressing the point that, that uh, and the idea that, that Cynthia was discussing in the context of the Maltese Falcon. So Hammett wasn't alone. He was representing uh, uh, the zeitgeist in, in a strange sort of way because others were doing uh, the same thing and addressing the same issues, but in very different types of detective stories. Thank you. And Professor Devine. Um, two points. I, I, when Cynthia, I wrote down, I think what, what she'd said, whose narrative can be affirmed. That just completely resonated with me as well. And what popped into my head as, as she said that is, I think Sam Spade's refrain sometimes through the novel, it'll hold. The story will hold. It's not important that the story be true, only that it holds. And I wonder how much that characterizes so much of our own conversation and debate today public in the public sphere. As long as the story holds, that's all that matters, rather than is the story authentic. So that on one point. And then the other is a historical point rather than a contemporary point. I've read I, I've taught this again in the, the arc of 19th century history and how does it fit in and how was Hammett as an author influenced by the period which he came up, in which he came of age and what was going on in the United States during that period. And I think that, and I'm going to forget the site, which is I've been sitting here trying to get the book right. I don't have it, but there is an author who's written um, on hard-boiled fiction sentimentality, talking about how the industrial revolution and the, uh, the, the rise of the trust as a, as a business organization changed people's attitudes about capitalism. And he, he, he fuses that discussion with trust is, as it's discussed in the, and in, in, uh, engaged in the, the novel, who can you trust? But at the same time, looking at how capitalism changed over the 19th century and even the use of the word, the trust uh, and, and the trust busters. I think that's another interesting aspect. We didn't, we didn't get to here, but it might be something your, your listeners might find interesting to, think in terms of how the 19th century industrial revolution influenced the writers that came of age in the, the teens and early 20s uh, who we've been mentioning. So that, that I think is my final observation. 
Thank you so much. Well, thank you all of you. And thank you to the audience. We do it for you. We can't do it without you. Now, I just want to have some final housekeeping notes. Uh, the plug, if you like this, consider joining the National Association of Scholars. We welcome members. We do many things. You can look at our website and among thing, other things, supporting webinar series like this. I will then just repeat some of the stuff I said at the beginning. If you have leftover questions, questions that weren't answered, questions that occur to you later, please send them to me, randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L -L -L at nas.org, and I'll be delighted to forward them to our panelists, who will then have the option to respond to you. We will be continuing our webinars. Gosh, we're nearly at the end of our American Literature webinar series. It's, oh... I won't even look at the calendar. We got one or two more of them, I think, through December 15th, and we're going to be at the end of that one. We're continuing our American Inventions webinar series. More will appear. And of course, we have all our regular NAS webinars. So continue to uh, tune in very frequently on Tuesday afternoons at 2 p.m. or Eastern time uh, to see the NAS webinars. And again, if you want to see this one again, it will be up within... 24 hours on the NAS YouTube channel. I believe that a link will be sent out to all the panelists and all of the uh, people who signed up for this, telling them what that uh, your precise web address is. But also, you can just go to the YouTube channel and just you'll look for it. Thank you again all so much. It's been wonderful. Uh, I got there was at least one last. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll just say. Uh, from Tom Mann, mission accomplished, you've made me want to read the book. And that is, I think, <laughs> everything one wants from a webinar. Um, it, it, if it's great American literature, everybody should just want to read it and enjoy it. And I think this would, clearly will uh, work on those grounds. So take care, everyone. It's been a wonderful time. Thank you.